going to Annapolis, Maryland, uh, Anne Arundel Urology. Congratulations. I'm really lucky to have a job at this time. I bet there are people in your year who had trouble because of COVID. Oh, absolutely. I know people who are like not not working at the moment. So when everyone was on the call, invested in taking care of those patients. So these are supposed to be the simple tools to bring back to the practice and also expanding the differential diagnosis when you're listening to the patient's story. So I think many of us are biased uh, against people who have pelvic pain. Um, the situation can feel overwhelming with many prior unrevealing evaluations. And of course, um, patients who have pain are anxious. So it's important to look at our own reaction. Why do we see the patient as difficult? And also, I think that in any diagnosis, if we don't know what to do, we decide uh, the issue is a patient factor. It's just a natural coping skill. Um, but when we see these patients, there is that bad feeling. If, if you can't help them, what do we do with this patient if her CAT scan is negative and how can we help her? Um, what if the patient has um, uh, maybe some personality considerations and um, is under-resourced socially as well? It makes it more difficult. Uh, what do we do if the patient is male or transgender? But um, there are resources for all of us, and um, the AUA has done a nice job of putting out guidelines on how to take care of interstitial cystitis. But of course, this is only a slice of the problem. Um, the International Continent Society did a nice job of, um, of putting out a document on the fundamentals of chronic pelvic pain, so expanding to um, site-specific versus central sensitization, the importance of identifying any inciting events, uh, the fact that we should treat each pain generator concurrently in order to have success, looking for comorbid conditions. And this document also um, it sort of describes the domains of chronic pelvic pain syndromes um, going beyond the genitourinary tract into uh, gynecologic pain, um, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, and neuropathic. The, uh, the European Association of Urology also has nice guidelines on chronic pelvic pain, and this is really looking at the pain syndromes where an ideology cannot be identified. So I went to all these lectures, read all these articles, and um, tried to find what I could out of uh, what was offered to treat my patients with pelvic pain so I didn't have to send them out the door uh, without help. And I really was failing with the articles I mentioned because they're really more classifying pelvic pain rather than giving um, treatment tools. So here we have um, the first article that I really found um, to be most helpful, and that was um, the differential diagnosis of pelvic pain. This article specifically is um, regarding women, and I think it was written by a private practitioner. I could be wrong, but um, this really allowed me to um, start to understand uh, how to evaluate these patients. And the second thing that really helped me understand how to take care of pain well was my colleagues who also take care of pain. So I learned a great deal from my colleagues over time um, sh through sharing patients. So th in this lecture, I'm hoping to give you 10 pearls for the differential diagnosis of pain. Um, and uh, it's going to be nine organ systems, GYN, GU, G GYN, GI, musculoskeletal, vascular, neurological, remembering that neurological and be central nervous system, peripheral entrapment, or uh, diffuse neuropathy, rheumatologic, and then of course the psychological mediators, which invariably come with living through a diagnosis like this. 
um, or can potentiate it. Um, and then we'll look a little bit at uh, diagnoses that are confined to the pelvis versus uh, diffuse or systemic syndromes. So in approaching a patient with pain, it's important to understand that pain can uh, become, uh, it can upregulate what's happening on the brain level. So this is called central sensitization. And uh, what happens is um, peripheral pain and visceral pain can have communication at the spinal and higher levels. And this can start upregulating what we do uh, when we anticipate or experience pain. So um, in minutes, we have changes in the existing protein activity, and this is called post-translational processing. And within days, we have actual changes in genetic transcription of the proteins. Um, so if you think about falling off a horse and getting back in the saddle, the reason that we put people back in the saddle when they fall off the horse is that um, those pain pathways or fear or trauma or anxiety pathways are laid down within minutes. And um, it's hard to undo them. It's a very, very efficient learning process. For example, uh, if you consider um, when you were a child, how many times you, if you consider when you were a child, how many times you touched a hot stove, maybe once, maybe twice, but certainly not a third time. Um, and so, Um, lay on top of that the, um, tr the a stressful living environment as a child, um, stressful experiences and traumatic experiences, uh, just what life hands us, and um, you can end up with potentiation and amplification of this central sensitization. Also, there's medical trauma, and so as uh, if somebody goes through an ICU stay, a near-death experience, a painful surgery, COVID, um, this can certainly add to uh, the level of um, anxiety and uh, pain processing abnormality in general. So my first tool is just a few communication tricks. They're really simple. Um, this applies to all patients, not just pain patients, but um, you wanna perform trauma-informed care. You never know if your CEO with prostate cancer um, has a history of uh, physical or sexual abuse as a child when he comes in for his prostate biopsy, for example. So you wanna give the patient um, a locus of control. You know, Would you prefer to take your pants all the way off or put them at your ankles? Would you prefer if my nurse is in the room for the exam or would you like your sister, et cetera? Um, we also need to validate the patient that will decrease their anxiety immediately. You know, We know your pain has causes, we can find a treatment. You know, I don't do a lot of pain, but I can, you know, give you some educational material and send you to my colleague. We will probably help. That's going to give the patient a very different feeling than if you say, I don't treat pain. End of story. Um, body language, um, sitting when you talk to the patient, uh, removing barriers, um, making eye contact, and also not blocking the door so they don't feel uh, a lack of ability to leave if they wish, if they're feeling anxious. Um, Stealing time, this is a generic interview trick um, that I learned as a medical student. If you ask the patient why they're here today and you wait 18 seconds, um, A, you get much more efficient delivery of information and B, the patient thinks you spent 15 minutes longer with them. When you encounter maladaptive coping, um, it's important, of course, to gauge your own reaction. I think in our fields, we're all pretty good at that. Um, but for me also to prevent burnout and taking care of these patients um, because of their level of complexity and because things can feel emergent. Um, uh, I do a lot of intake forms, as I'm sure many of you remember. Um, I use a patient gateway, which is the patient communication system. So if messages come in that are complicated, I'll convert that message to a virtual visit rather than a phone call. And um, at the end of the visit with my patient, especially if we're starting to run out of time, which is common, I'll return with patient education and resources for, for them to have something to work on before the next visit. And then interprofessional collaboration is a huge source of satisfaction for all of us. Um, and uh, in right where my skills uh, end, for example, if someone has gen uh, GI components or we need physical therapy or um, uh, psychology, then we'll collaborate together on the patient for a better outcome. 
this is called the treatment map. I'm happy to share it with uh, anyone who wishes. Um, it is a list of um, medications by category, for example, um, alpha blocker, uh, anticholinergic, um, pain medication, et cetera, neuropathic pain medication by category with response, um, procedures and surgeries by category with response, diagnostics, providers, diagnosis, and plan. So I'll have my patients fill this out before we speak. And so I can kind of flip through and get um, a thumbprint when I first uh, look at the information. And then um, they can take it home and keep track of what they tried and what helped not only for me, but for other providers, so things are organized. And sometimes it's a big aha when I, someone has urinary urgency and frequency and I see they've never tried an anticholinergic or they have um, obstructive symptoms and they've never tried an alpha blocker, especially in females. Um, so the differential diagnosis, what we're gonna do is go through those uh, nine organ systems, um, just eyeballing what is out there and what, what can be when you're hearing the story of a patient with pain. And obviously the story that, you know, how quickly did the pain come on and um, uh, what seemed to be any inciting events and what got worse when is, is gonna give you clues. So gynecologic etiology of chronic pelvic pain. Um, there are uh, adnexal pathologies, for example, ovarian cysts, some of which uh, can be observed and will resolve on their own and some of which um, will need to be addressed surgically, especially if there is a question of malignancy. Um, ovarian remnant syndrome is sort of a phantom pain after oophorectomy. Um, uterine pathologies, so um, these in this list tend to be uh, cyclic. There can be an intermittent component in between. Um, but the way to think about endometriosis or um, adenomyosis with the cycles is it's kind of like having a bruise. So adenomyosis is when the endometrial tissue um, enters the, the muscular wall of the uterus, and endometriosis is when it um, sort of exits into the peritoneal cavity, implants, grows. Um, it can actually uh, create nerve entrapment. It can invade the peritoneum, and um, uh, God bless our colleagues in GYN who do these surgeries because you can really um, get into the sacral nerves, and um, it can be a very difficult resection. Um, like a cancer that has spread. And of course, middle schmerz is ovulatory pain. This is um, all of these um, ideologies of chronic pelvic pain are treated basically with uh, hormonal manipulation, um, sometimes surgical manipulation, and certainly um, the endometriosis would be a surgical diagnosis. So pelvic girdle ligament pain associated with pregnancy is an um, is actually quite a common source of chronic pelvic pain in pregnancy and um, can be treated safely during pregnancy with pelvic floor physical therapy. The physical exam, um, it's important to eyeball the vulva uh, when you're doing the exam. Um, so uh, you can use a Q-tip to figure out where sensitivities are um, and there are glands, so at 1 and 11 o'clock are Skene's glands around the urethra, and then at um, 5 and 7 o'clock are your vestibular glands. And so in this picture, this is a patient with normal estrogenization. You can see inflamed vestibular glands. This patient has diffuse uh, erythema. It could certainly be a reaction to a medication or something, but uh, you can also see this kind of picture in vulvar atrophy. So you know, it, it, it always surprises me sort of at um, my level of complexity, how many women come into me with pelvic pain and I see that there's this level of vaginal atrophy and no contraindication to vaginal estrogen. Um, of no uh, vaginal estrogen can be mixed in um, um, hypoallergenic bases. So your compound pharmacy will have sort of a menu of what's gonna be like esterase vaginal cream about one out of 10 patients will have an allergic reaction to esterase because of the alcohol base. Um, we're, we'll talk more about this later, but uh, this has to do with the pelvic floor muscles. So during the physical exam, uh, if you feel the pelvic floor muscles, you will feel if they are tight, tense, and tender, and we'll give you some more specifics in later slides. Vulvar exposures, I can't tell you uh, how many women I've helped with this list. Um, there are 
things that cause irritation of the vulva, whether you're 22 or 82. Um, Non-oxanol 9 on condoms is a common one. Uh, recycled toilet papers that have filaments that cause little splinters. And um, soaps, perfume soaps, dial, etc. I'm happy to share these slides with anyone who wishes them. Um, female genital mutilation is not something we see uh, altogether commonly um, in the Northeast, but it certainly does exist. Uh, it is important to know um, that a woman who has had prior uh, female genital mutilation or cutting uh, probably still has some clitoral tissue underneath, and um, certainly down the carora should still be present. Um, and there is potential for neuroma and uh, scarring, and obviously um, you may see as well underneath pelvic floor muscle spasm, et cetera. Uh, chronic pelvic pain after mesh surgery, you may see changes in posture, um, and you may be able to appreciate uh, mesh erosion on physical exam. Uh, this is often palpable rather than visible or vice versa. Treatment of vulvodynia becomes a little more complicated than I think this lecture is um, designed for, but uh, if there's an infection, it should be sought and treated, for example, chlamydia. Uh, atrophy should be addressed. Uh, physical therapy can help with vulvodynia, decreasing lactic acid and improving blood flow. Um, oral medications like tricyclics can be helpful or neuropathic pain medications. As occasionally, we'll do Botox to the vulva. There is not um, a great literature out there on this uh, off-label use of Botox. Um, injectable inject, interventional pain techniques like local, local injections, and very rarely surgery. Of course, this is not a surgery that I do, but um, we, I don't see this done very often. On physical examination, sometimes when people complain of chronic pelvic pressure, you'll find a prolapse, so it's important to uh, split the speculum, have the patient cough and push, and see if you have a significant prolapse. Okay, so that was the GYN differential. This is the urological differential. Um, so if you have a patient who comes into your urology office, of course, you're gonna be thinking about interstitial cystitis. Um, pelvic floor dystonia is very common in our urology patients, male and female. Um, and also this pelvic floor dystonia can be a reaction to hip pain, um, uh, issues with uh, osteoarthritis, et cetera. So it's important to sort of think about the entire pelvis. And a urethral diverticulum is a less common, but certainly um, often overlooked cause of pelvic pain. And in our uh, pelvic reconstruction surgeries in urology, we also see mesh erosion. So if you hear a patient complaining of recurrent UTI, it's important to ask about post void dribbling, as well as um, if someone complains of dyspruenia, post void dribbling and recurrent UTI, you'll um, often see pyuria. Um, you may appreciate a cystic feeling when you compress the urethra against the pubic synthesis on physical exam, but um, often you don't. But if you do suspect on exam a, a urethral diverticulum, you can draw your fingers along the anterior vaginal wall and uh, see if any uh, milk-like fluid comes out the urethra. A ureteric stone, I've probably seen one patient a year over the past 10 years who was labeled as chronic pelvic pain, who had a distal ureteric stone lodged in the intramural ureter as the source of the pain. Clues to this would be um, acute onset of the pain. Um, there isn't always, but of course can be uh, flank pain at that time. Uh, and also, um, it can be more to one side than the other than the standard typical chronic pelvic pain. If you have a patient with refractory overactive bladder who hasn't responded to anticholinergics um, or has irritation that's not improving, eventually a cystoscopy is indicated to rule out neoplasm. Of course, um, we've all seen talks on interstitial cystitis in the past. Um, Current thinking is that um, fulguration of Hunter's lesion, if present, uh, is beneficial in good quality data. And we have guidelines on that. Um, so there are these beautiful guidelines on interstitial cystitis and um, first and second line treatments 
include things like modifying caffeine, uh, pelvic floor physical therapy, and then we move up to um, fourth and fifth line treatments. So fourth line would include Botox to the bladder. Uh, this is still off label, but there's good data on the use of Botox for uh, interstitial cystitis pain. Sacral neural modulation, also this is off label. However, uh, there is uh, data on its use in pain. Um, fortunately, uh, typically these patients will also have urgency and frequency. So um, the use of sacral neuromodulation off label for the pain is accompanied by um, FDA approved usage for the urgency and frequency. And um, six line surgical therapy would be um, augmentation cystoplasty or cystectomy. Um, augmentation cystoplasty does not have great success in interstitial cystitis. And um, the if the patient is diverted for the purpose of pain, it would be recommended to remove the bladder at the same time to avoid pyocystis. Uh, in men and women, bladder outlet obstruction can certainly cause chronic pelvic pain. So eventually, if the chronic pelvic pain continues, especially in the setting of voiding symptoms, then urodynamics uh, can be employed based on the situation and the, the patient story. Uh, urgency, frequency, obstructive symptoms, incomplete emptying, recurrent UTIs. Um, but this is, not, this is not part of the initial workup without specific indication. Okay, so that was urological ideology. Um, next is colobesical ideology for chronic pelvic pain. Um, diverticular disease can lead, of course, to diverticulitis, but also stricture, fistula, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, which certainly has a great deal of communication with the central nervous system, um, levator ani syndrome, which we've discussed a couple of times already. Proctalgia fugax is a little different than levator ani syndrome. It's a spasm of the rectal sphincter. Um, it doesn't really have a treatment. It tends to be short spasms that last five minutes to 30 minutes, and they occur sporadically. Um, prevention isn't really thought to be um, helpful. However, there are medications like nephetipine ointment that can be helpful at the time of the pain. Anal fistula and abscess can cause chronic pain. Pruritus ani is sort of an itchiness around the anus. Um, hemorrhoids, rectal prolapse can lead to pain, warts, and of course, malignancy, anal cancer, rectal cancer and Paget's disease. So colovesical fistula, I've seen this as a cause of chronic pelvic pain in the setting of cancer once or twice, not too often, but of course, depending on uh, the accompanying symptoms, eventually uh, abdominal imaging is indicated for pelvic pain in most patients if they're refractory. Um, and diverticulitis, the pain's usually gonna be in the left lower quadrant, but not always. Um, and they may have accompanying constipation, diarrhea, uh, blood in the stool is rare, um, but patients with diverticulitis, 10 to 15% of them have urgency frequency or dysuria due to irritation of the bladder from the inflammation. Next organ system is vascular. So pelvic venous congestion syndrome. Uh, you may see dilated uh, varices along the labia majora or um, the perineal tissues. Uh, you may see uh, dilated veins on the legs or not, or you could see none. Um, but what happens is there's retrograde flow in a weak ovarian vein. Um, the morning tends to be okay and the patient has more discomfort with standing. The uh, hormonal, hormonal changes throughout the cycle do worsen the pain. You'll see dyspruenia, bladder irritability can be present, GI symptoms, low back pain. And um, on physical exam, ovarian point tenderness on exam with a history of a postcoital ache is 94% sensitive and 77% specific for pelvic congestion syndrome. Uh, so pelvic congestion syndrome can be caused, one of the causes aside from just incompetent uh, veins is 
Two of the causes are nutcracker syndrome, which is compression of the left renal vein between the aorta and the SMA, and also May-Turner syndrome, which is compression of the left iliac vein by the iliac artery. I think Ron's seen a bunch of these. Okay, next organ system is musculoskeletal pain. So um, we can see a high tone iliopsoas muscle, which can mimic flank pain in um, the setting of stones. And in that case, the pain will go uh, also into the medial thigh and it can be palpated just superior to the inguinal ligament um, and trauma to the bony pelvis. So um, eyeballing the patient when the patient walks in the room is a helpful a tool on the physical exam. For uh, women with chronic pelvic pain, 70% of them have a history of trauma or infection of the genitourinary region, and you'll find uh, abnormal posture, movement, gait, sitting posture, and respiration versus control. High tone pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. So uh, in women with chronic pelvic pain, and I don't have great data in men, but it certainly is present in men as well, Pelvic floor muscle, muscle dysfunction occurs in up to 87% of women who complain of pain, but myofascial pain on physical exam is present in 13% of women on screening. So it's, it's just good to do as part of your overall physical exam. Um, and the state of these overactive muscle contractions results in decreased urine flow rates, obstructed defecation, dyspareunia, pain, anxiety, distress, and can even result in pudendal nerve entrapment. So, uh, I, I'd like you to remember from this talk that um, examining these muscles is very simple in men and women. A part of your rectal exam or part of your pelvic exam, you just put the finger at a 45 degree angle to reach these muscles. Um, and you can reach the obturator internus, uh, the puborectalis, the iliocoxygeus. So puborectalis is here from the pubis around the rectum, and the iliocoxygeus is from the ilium to the coccyx. And um, the obturator internus, you all know where that is. It's, it's going to be more upwards on your exam. Uh, a very easy way to um, score the exam is to just uh, compare it to your thenar eminence. So relaxed is normal. Uh, finger against the thumb is going to be moderate ten uh, tenseness. And um, finger against the pinky is severe hardness of those muscles, and if the patient experiences pain, you can have them assign a visual analog scale if you wish, or you can just know that it hurts, and in that manner, you can find trigger points. Uh, so with pelvic floor dystonia, um, down training of those pelvic floor muscles with internal physical therapy decreases crosstalk along the sacral nerves, and um, it will actually, you, the patient can learn to modify uh, their voiding reflexes by um, increasing tone at the level of the external sphincter. It goes all the way up through uh, to the pontine micturition center, and uh, um, they also can inhibit the bladder. And then um, relaxing the muscles overall is going to relax any uh, crosstalk of the pelvic floor muscles to the bladder and the rectum. Um, there's uh, Malachina did studies of rats and found that there's 20% crosstalk between the levator muscles and the bladder, at least in rats. And certainly, I do observe that in humans. So, um, what kind of data is there out there for pelvic floor physical therapy for high tone pelvic floor dysfunction? Um, well, the techniques are varied. They include feel massage, which is pushing along the fibers of the muscles. Uh, trigger point work, where uh, they're working specifically on the trigger points. Biofeedback, where the patient's watching and seeing if they're contracting appropriately. Electrical stimulation, uh, breathing and posture work. And interestingly, the breathing and posture work is uh, a big part of um, what the patients come back and tell you about that was helpful. But in randomized trials, um, the pelvic PT has been shown to be superior to global therapeutic massage in women and men. Uh, equivalent to levator injections with triamcinolone and bupivacaine, and effective in pelvic girdle pain of pregnancy. Uh, however, due to the heterogeneity of techniques and patient characteristics, of course, more data is needed. 
um, bony etiology of pain, so um, pubic diastasis. This is a patient I saw who was 18 and had her first child, and so uh, there were assumptions about her psychological state, but she um, was sent home with uh, pubic diastasis. What you'll see in these patients is uh, suprapubic pain, tenderness, swelling, and edema. It can radiate to the legs, hip, and the back. Uh, it's worse with weight bearing, especially with climbing stairs and walking. Um, and uh, the pain can be evoked during physical exam by bi bilateral pressure on the trochanters and hip flexion with the legs in extension. Diagnosis is radiographic and the treatment is surgical. Another thing that we see in young women, and I've seen a number of these over the years, these young female athletes with uh, um, suprapubic pain, when you examine the uh, pubic synthesis, it's tender to palpation. Um, so uh, it's the athletes, it's thought to be sort of micro trauma, especially as they're still growing and um, there may be hormonal changes making the uh, ligaments more or less flexible. Um, so with all of the athletics, there's micro trauma to the pubic synthesis and it can lead to osteitis pubis. And in fact, um, in some of these young women, it can turn into osteomyelitis, presumably due to hematogenous spread of bacteria from the mouth, et cetera. Uh, ergonomics, this is a patient, um, if you look at this CAT scan, obviously this is not a patient whose iliocondylate I wanted to redo surgically. Um, and she was bounced around, she, you know, uh, is in a wheelchair, she lives with an aide, et cetera. Um, and uh, it was thought that perhaps her um, conduit was the source of her pain. Um, but in looking at her imaging, her coccyx was pointing right at her bed and her aide told me that she actually spent all of her time on her back, always. She was never rolled. And so um, simply uh, just changing the ergonomics for this patient um, saved her an operation that wasn't planning to help her. Neurological causes of pain. Um, so there can be, it's really important to think of neurological causes of pain in terms of central, specific discrete peripheral, and diffuse peripheral. So there are upper motor neuron syndromes like cervical myelopathies, um, spasticity, detrusor sphincter dyssynergic can lead to pelvic pain. Lower motor neuron syndromes, including cauda equina, uh, sacral plexus, and nerve entrapment, and peripheral and inflammatory neuropathies. So um, this is another uh, pearl that can be extremely helpful in that um, the patients can map out their pain maps. This is from the MAP network, uh, and this is from the International Pelvic uh, Pain Society document, who, by the way, um, they have a nice free downloadable pelvic pain document um, that's a combination of some standardized measures and things like this where the patient can uh, report their pain and follow it over time. Um, Cauda equina syndrome, well, in many cases, this is a medical emergency, which I think everybody uh, understands the basics of. Um, you may see bowel or bladder dysfunction, urinary retention with overflow incontinence, saddle anesthesia, bilateral sciatica, and leg weakness. Most commonly, this is a tumor or a midline disc. Um, there can be, uh, other causes can be an abscess, um, tethered cord syndrome, arachnoiditis, um, and also more diffuse infections like uh, CMV or Epstein-Barr, Lyme, et cetera. Um, Cauda equina syndrome can be a slow, like a sacral tumor. So just because the patient's had symptoms for a long time doesn't mean it's not uh, time to image their spine. This is a young lady who uh, came to me. She was 18 with severe urethral pain. She had a history of sexual assault once at age 17. She felt she had processed it and it was not a primary issue for her in her pain. Um, but the assumption in many of the notes I reviewed were that this was psychological, but she ended up um, having a diagnosis of Sherman's disease, which is kind of like a kyphosis of the lumbar spine in a young person. I had never seen this before. And treatment is sometimes surgical and other times uh, more physical therapy and observation. This is a gentleman I saw. He had seen multiple urologists over the years. Um, it has started with uh, 
avoiding dysfunction, frequency, urgency uh, that had um, progressed to urgent continence. He then started having um, urinary retention, uh, erectile dysfunction, fecal incontinence. And you can see, I shared this patient actually with Andrew Dubin, but on his first uh, visit, he walked in with an abnormal gait. You can see his flat glutes and his atrophic calf, and he ended up having a slow growing sacral tumor. You can also see a picture like this in adult tethered cord. One or two times a year, uh, we'll see a patient with um, adult tethered cord who has pelvic pain and um, was heretofore undiagnosed. And you often will see again, bladder bowel symptoms, uh, sexual symptoms, uh, ambulation. Uh, this is a department chair at my institution um, who has uh, Tarloff cysts. These are common. They're often, um, the patients are often told that the Tarloff cysts are asymptomatic and not the cause of their pain. Um, but uh, there's um, more recent data by Oaklander et al. and um, multiple other reports that certainly these can cause pain. Um, this gentleman had surgical intervention for the Tarloff cysts and his pain is now worse, unfortunately. Um, this is a very unfortunate diagnosis and um, it is important really to enlist your collaborators for this patient, uh, starting with conservative therapies like working on muscle tension. But um, uh, I think this gentleman is headed, he's tried a couple of spinal stimulators without success, and I think he's headed for an in intrathecal pain pump. Uh, peripheral pelvic nerve entrapment. So uh, peripheral pelvic nerves are compression of a single nerve or nerve root. Symptoms would be pain, tingling, numbness, and muscle weakness on the affective nerves dermatome. And it can be caused by endometriosis, fibrosis, graft, suture, uh, vascular or muscular entrapment or transection. Um, so uh, if you have a patient who comes back from your surgery or you know, a colleague's surgery uh, with pain after surgery as the inciting event, it's really important to do a good uh, dermatome exam, which I'll show you in a moment. So for example, uh, one surgery that uh, that we do in FPMRS and, and, um, is a sacrospinous ligament vault fixation uh, for vaginal prolapse. And uh, here we come close, if we're not careful, to the penendal nerve, which is passing just underneath the ischial spine. We also can get the nerve to the levator ani and a uh, rectal branch. It's important to remember that um, many of the nerves that can cause pelvic pain actually start in the lumbosacral trunk or start in the lumbar region. And um, so just because somebody had surgery higher up or um, uh, it, it uh, doesn't, it certainly uh, can originate from a higher level of the pain. So here um, is an example of the dermatomes in a male. And I really like this diagram from Gray's because it shows you um, S3, S4, S5, S2 on one side, and it shows you the specific nerves because uh, the nerves often have a combination of different nerve roots. So for example, the ilioinguinal nerve, the perineal nerve, the obturator nerve, um, the posterior femoral cutaneous nerves. And, I reference this if I'm examining a patient for a specific uh, nerve or entrapment. I'll actually just reference this picture. I don't have it memorized. And uh, the same in a female. So examples of um, pelvic nerve entrapment, uh, gen the genitofemoral nerve can be injured during a pelvic lymphadenectomy. The obturator nerve, uh, we all know too well in urology, um, injury can occur during the, the pelvic lymphadenectomy. It can occur due to deep endometriosis with or without resection, a dissection of the paravesical fossa, the space of retius, or um, the iliolumbar fossa. The pudendal nerve, um, the most common injury in urology would be the sacrospinous ligament vault fixation. So what do we do if patients are refractory to intervention for pain from a neurological standpoint? Um, well, there are systemic pain medications, but also um, there are dorsal root stimulators. There's spinal cord stimulated stimulation that can be placed along the dura. Um, and 
with our intrathecal pain pumps and uh, you all have someone in uh, Albany for whoever is logging on from Albany. Uh, Julie Plotis is uh, wonderful for this and I actually still send her patients. Okay, so diffuse neuropathic pain. Um, peripheral neuropathy is experienced by approximately 40 million people in the United States and many of our patients. And many of these neuropathies are mixed with both large and small fiber involvement. So um, increasingly recognized as a demonstration of specific involvement of small myelinated or unmyelinated fibers, otherwise known as small fiber neuropathies. So um, common neuropathic pain diagnoses, of course, everyone knows about diabetic peripheral neuropathy, post-herpetic neuralgia, um, you can have complex regional pain syndrome, phantom limb pain, uh, spinal cord injury. Certainly there are a lot of pain syndromes associated with spinal cord injury, um, but small fiber polyneuropathy, I'm gonna take a little time to talk about because uh, the autonomic nervous system is involved and so we see a lot of it in urology due to bladder dysfunction. So if a patient has diffuse pain, this suggests a systemic process. And um, this is another slide that I think it would be very useful to remember when you're seeing patients. Um, we, I did this study with Charles Argoff. We looked at our complex pelvic pain patients. Um, these were patients who either had refractory pelvic pain to our standard interventions or who had multi-system disease at presentation. Um, so we sent uh, the patients to Charles for evaluation of small fiber polyneuropathy, which included a skin biopsy and a physical exam looking at sensory abnormalities. Um, and uh, of the 39 patients with complex pelvic pain, two thirds of them had a biopsy showing small fiber polyneuropathy. And the biopsy is only 70% sensitive. Um, of this group, a significant proportion of them had comorbid conditions of diffuse chronic pain syndromes, including GERD, migraine, IBS, low back pain, fibromyalgia, interstitial cystitis, vulvodynia, and other chronic pain syndromes. You can also see things like orthostasis, hair loss, um, and the list goes on. So if you see at a glance, the patient's list uh, is hearkening to this type of a situation. Um, certainly think that the patient has a, a diffuse process, small fiber polyneuropathy, um, and, and, um, and some of this can be reversed or certainly helped by more neuropathically oriented pain medications. So the symptoms um, for, since, so in the small nerve fibers, we have both the somatosensory nerve fibers, the pain fibers, and the autonomic nerve fibers. So the type of pain they might have would be cold-like pain, tingling, pins and needles, burning pain, electric-like pain, allodynia. Um, when the, these patients talk about, oh, you know, I have pain all over and symptoms fluctuate from day to day, um, you know, historically many of us would sort of turn off at that point in the conversation, but um, it's important to recognize that this might actually be a true physiologic diagnosis. Um, and then, of course, we see all the autonomic dysfunction. So um, this is an example of what uh, small fiber polyneuropathy looks like on um, biopsy. Uh, so this is a normal 18-year-old male without uh, small fiber, and this is an 18-year-old male with small fiber, and the difference that the pathologist is looking for, and it's special pathologist, not just your, your average pathology department. Um, it's usually, I think, a send-up biopsy, uh, they, they have a um, lower number of axons per millimeter squared, and then those axons that remain are functioning abnormally. So what kind of autonomic symptoms are we seeing? So um, we might see uh, lacrimal and salivary gland dysfunction, accommodation and pupillary dysfunction, uh, cardiovascular dysfunction, so POTS syndrome. Um, dizziness on standing, those patients who get dizzy when you give them alpha blockers, um, gastrointestinal dysfunction, genitourinary dysfunction, neurogenic bladder. So patients that come in with incomplete bladder emptying with no spinal cord issue, um, IBS, et cetera, uh, 
constipation, they have a bowel movement, you know, once every 10 days, for example, uh, sexual dysfunction and also impaired function of the sweat glands. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, um, I usually refer to my colleagues, although it's, uh, it takes a long time to get an appointment for this type of neurologist who specializes in autonomic dysfunction. Um, so I'll order the autonomic testing and the skin biopsy on the way to that consult. So these tests are done by the time the patient has the visit. Um, so the um, autonomic function taste testing, it's basically um, tilt table testing and they're looking also for, um, so they're looking for orthostatic changes as well as uh, sweat production changes. What can cause small fiber polyneuropathy? Well, um, autoimmune diseases like uh, lupus, um, diabetes, which we're all pretty familiar with, um, uh, B12 deficiency, uh, celiac disease and gluten sensitivity. So um, it's important to recognize these patients because uh, many of these causes are reversible. And 40% um, of patients who end up with this diagnosis of small fiber polyneuropathy, which is a heterogeneous diagnosis, but 40% of them, uh, in 40% of those patients, an ideology can be identified. Lyme disease, amyloid. So rheumatologic causes of chronic pelvic pain um, include arthritis, PMR, osteomalacia, myopathies, spondyloarthropathies. There's a whole group of them. They're really complicated. Um, systemic lupus erythematosus. Um, and then also there are endocrine causes like hypothyroidism. And um, neurologic causes of this uh, widespread or diffuse to diagnose localized pain include um, multiple sclerosis, interestingly, Chiari malformation, spinal stenosis, and um, polyneuropathy. There are some inflammatory neuropathies. And fibromyalgia, which um, there's some literature out there about uh, a significant proportion of fibromyalgia cases being uh, reclassified to small fiber polyneuropathy, given more current literature. So psychological factors, well, um, Psychological factors are going to be present dealing with any chronic illness, and I think especially pain. Um, so it's important to know that there are interventions for this, which are extremely effective. I was just speaking with a urologist recently who had whiplash about 20 years ago and had severe right arm pain and um, would employ these uh, mind over matter um, cognitive tricks like um, imagining that the hand was connected directly to the brain rather than there being an arm in between and using that technique could get through removing a large renal mass, um, whereas otherwise uh, you know, some people may not have been able to operate without that cognitive trick. So um, there is neuroplasticity that because of central sensitization, uh, the brain map can expand over time if um, there isn't intervention, but there are some very clever techniques uh, that can be used with cognitive behavioral therapy to use the brain to treat the pain and return the patients to a better quality of life. Uh, global treatments of chronic pelvic pain, well, of course, there are systemic medications depending on the ideology, um, and this is probably beyond the scope of this talk, but there's a nice review in the um, European Association of Urology Guidelines. Uh, opioids, uh, there's been a big change in the way we use them over time. I actually never prescribed them. Um, and uh, I would defer to pain specialists for chronic opioid use. So in conclusion, um, patients with pelvic pain can be effectively helped. Uh, caring for these patients is often straightforward, especially early in their course. And referral systems exist for more complex patients. I can't uh, can't overemphasize the importance of multidisciplinary collaboration. I almost never see a pain patient by myself. And the, the specialty I most often involve is pelvic floor physical therapy. And uh, there's some wonderful ones in uh, Albany and upstate New York. I, I have lists of them if anyone would like them. Um, so uh, we recently wrote a book for patients about pelvic pain. There are about 60 authors from 20 different specialties and um, that should come out in August, and hopefully it will put some of these tools into the patient's hands. 
and um, there are some additional resources here. Um, the ICS Institute has some nice lectures about public pain. We have the AUA guidelines, the EAU guidelines, the IPPS has a great website. Um, their ICS standardization documents, as mentioned above. Uh, their patient resources, um, the interstitial cystitis network is very actively curated. Uh, Facing Public Pain, that book that I mentioned. And um, we have an upcoming webinar similar to this talk, including Charles Argoff from Albany um, on June 26th um, on the International Continent Society website. And that's the end of the lecture. Thank you, Dr. Day. That was a very comprehensive talk on pain. Very great talk. Um, I have a question. So in this current climate with, um, with COVID and how we're trying to limit the number of patient exposures coming into clinic and, you know, with the understanding that a lot of the uh, urology sort of pain, both the pain management as well as the pain evaluation is very, tends to be very hands-on. How do you go about um, sort of that initial management, um, especially with telemedicine and with uh, with COVID? So it's been pretty interesting. Uh, I, I, I find that COVID has sort of deconstructed medicine in many ways, and um, I'm surprised at how much we can do uh, on a virtual visit. I've had a bunch of new patient visits virtually for avoiding dysfunction and pain. and um, so I have the ability to send patient education through the patient gateway, which is the communication system. And so I'll start patients out with a lot of education, and then I simply planned urodynamics or cystoscopy, including a pelvic exam at the first visit if needed. And um, there are some patients I haven't been able to get my hands on yet for a physical exam. And kind of going alongside that, Dr. Meehan in his chat box uh, said, sound like patients, they do require a real exam. And do you find that many physicians are unable uh, to perform a good exam? Um, no, I think I think it's just a matter, I'm sure that everybody who watched this talk, if, if um, they were paying attention to those slides, can now do a good exam for for pain, looking for prolapse, looking for uh, tight, tense pelvic floor muscles, looking for vaginal atrophy, and looking for trigger points for pain, looking at the dermatomes. It's not a complicated exam, and in fact, it doesn't take a long time if the patient gave you proper reporting ahead of time. Another question I had was. Um sort of coming off of pelvic floor physical therapy. Uh, I know from the sort of experience in our clinic, I feel like it's not necessarily utilized as much by other providers. Um, and sometimes they may be, you know, the only thing that can benefit them. Uh, do you feel that's the same way out in Massachusetts too, that most, maybe it's like their family physician is their gateway and they don't have the referrals to pelvic floor as soon as they should have. Absolutely, because of course they shouldn't see us at all if they're going to resolve with physical therapy. And um, it's, I think it's much better than it was 10 years ago though. 10 years ago, no one had ever heard of this type of PT, even uh, some physical therapists, but it's much more mainstream now, but it, it would definitely uh, benefit patient care if it were more of a the first stop. I've seen patients who had a hysterectomy and their pain you know, their pain persisted and they resolved with PT over and over again, or even a cystectomy. I have a comment here in the chat box from Dr. Alex Arnouk. Uh, you may remember him. Uh, very helpful talk, thank you very much. I have found in practice that many patients are initially hesitant to go to pelvic floor PT, but once they do, they find it very beneficial. Do you have any strategies that encourages multimodal treatment strategies? Absolutely. So I think the patient education about the physical therapy is helpful. Um, having a list of, of physical therapists for the patient to call 
and I hand them the referral because my front desk isn't going to be able to have the time to make the phone call, et cetera. So I just give the patient the list and they check their insurance, et cetera. But I'd say about 30% of the time, even when I jump up and down and talk about how great physical therapy is and engage my scribe to say, yes, all the patients do really well. 30% of the time, the patients come back without having done it, if not 40%. So when they come back not having done it, um, I, I ask them to schedule at least one visit to, as a as an evaluation by the physical therapist, just like they have done with me. If they're, you know, you did fine with your pelvic exam with me, but maybe you could just go for an evaluation and hear what the physical therapist has to offer you or say about your diagnosis of your muscles, the way that you wanted your diagnosis of your bladder with me. And um, that sounds much more palatable than, you know, you're going to commit to 10 vaginal exams. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Day. Um, last question from Chloe Shank here. Uh, Dr. Shank, which resources would you recommend for PCPs to try for education um, other than narcotics? A lot of patients that I've talked to have done their own research and have asked for a referral when they get frustrated by their interactions with their PCP. A referral. Oh, I see, because we're following on a PCP question. Um, yes. Well, of course, that's a great time to make a referral. I mean, you're kind of stuck, but um, I would say that for most patients, the first step is avoidance of irritants, um, you know, bladder irritants like diet soda, external irritants, um, and the physical therapy, as long as there's no hematuria or anything else obligating further workup. And if the patient, uh, goes and does well, then of course no referral is needed. But um, the, the medications, patients will call asking for medications for pain. Um, I think it's important to try to avoid uh, narcotics as the first line of medications. So other options might be um, a baclofen or a muscle relaxant or you know, simple pain medications. And um, if, if whoever asked that question would like that treatment map, I can send it and it, it, it just sort of lays all the medications out uh, and all, all of the interventions out as options in a way that's kind of easy to flip through. All right, Dr. Day, thank you so much. We've reached uh, the time for our lecture. Uh, once again, great talk. I think this is, you know, very, very important, especially for so many of our own patients. And it can be quite a minefield, as you've mentioned in your talk, uh, trying to lay out all the numerous reasons and uh, modalities for treatment. So thank you again. Yes, thank you all so much. So I, I wish I could see you all. I wish you all had your videos on. And thank you so much. Hello. Can you see me now? Yes. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot. Very nice talk. Thank you, Bidar. Bye. Bye-bye.